You are listening to the Foreign Policy Focus Podcast. We cannot wait for the final proof. The smoking gun it could come in the form of a mushroom cloud. Have you driven enough people from their homes over and bulldoze their villages, seize their property and their laws? They had no part in making Now working in Libya with friends and allies, we've demonstrated what collective action can achieve in the 21st century. Now the host of the show, Kyle Inslee. This is episode 363 of the Foreign Policy Focus podcast. On today's show, I'm covering the U.S. taking a more offensive approach against cyber warfare with Russia. I have updates on the protests in Hong Kong and how this is creating controversy within the libertarian movement. And I have more news and analysis on what's going on between the U.S. and Iran, the potential for war there. Alright guys, I need you to take the time to share the show or recommend it to somebody. You find the show at the Libertarian Institute. Along with my daily news roundup, it's featured in the right-hand column on the homepage. If you listen to a few shows now and you like it, make sure you subscribe to the show somewhere. I update current events on the show, and the way you get the most out of it is by listening to every episode. So, YouTube, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, it should be up anywhere anybody's listening to podcasts. And if it's not, send me an email and I'll try to get it up there. Last, if you want to support the show financially, you do that at patreon.com slash foreign policy focus. I am pretty terrible at keeping up with my patron commitments, but I will be doing a live stream. Uh, right now, the tentative plan is this Thursday at 9 p.m. Eastern. I plan on sending the patrons a link uh, to a Google Hangout, and we will hang out and chat at least for an hour, and then we could possibly upload it or whatever else if people want to listen to it later. But That's something you'll get access to for anybody who's donating $5 to the show or more a month. So check out patreon.com if you want to do that. All right, now getting into the news here. A couple stories that have a little bit less to do with foreign policy than the usual stuff I cover, but nonetheless are important. The first is the FBI and federal police agencies are starting to introduce more facial recognition systems. Now, I probably have an audience of almost all libertarians, maybe some leftists mostly interested in foreign policy. But I'm guessing anybody listening to the show is skeptical enough of the government and what their true intentions are to think that, oh, it may not be a good thing if every time I'm walking around the mall, some camera is taking my picture and that's being sent to the government that says, you know, Kyle Anselm was in this time on this state in this place. And, you know, this is his picture later going down this road from a toll and all that other kind of crazy stuff. Uh, I don't want I don't want to be trapped that much by the government. And certainly not one like the U.S. government that's, you know, carried out drone strikes against its own citizens overseas. We certainly persecute whistleblowers, Chelsea Manning, Edward Snowden, journalists, if you look at Julian Assange. And so the more distance you can have between you and the government and the less power the government has over you, certainly the better. And with this facial recognition, I you know, I see a problem with that encroaching on liberties. The other thing going on here, and I'm going to link to this article in the show notes page for those of you who want to understand it in more details than I really do. But basically, the facial recognition programs have some software kind of problems where they're not really good at doing what they're supposed to do and also some privacy concerns. And so I guess at one point, this facial recognition program was run on a bunch of members in Congress. And apparently they did a legitimate test and not something rigged up because a whole bunch of members of Congress, I think particularly some... Um, african-american or people of color were misidentified as criminals and that you know raises a lot of concerns as to how well this works and then i guess there's privacy concerns as far as you know if somebody gets this information and they want to harm you it would certainly be very valuable you know we've had reports in the past that people in the nsa use some of their data collection and spying systems to Look into ex wives or keep up with their current wife, see who's calling, how who they're talking to, how long for. And, you know, it would put really people's lives in jeopardy to, you know, have this and much information out of them, even just from the corruption standpoint, and not even, you know, the government doing something crazy, tyrannical and killing people. I guess members of Congress are paranoid enough about this because at least in the article I read, they were very critical of the FBI for not implementing recommended changes to cover up some of these problems but that you know this is something we don't really have to look forward to in the future with poorly functioning facial recognition systems taking pictures and collecting data on all of us at all the time you know this will probably lead to a lot of wrongful arrests and stuff like that if it's actually rolled out and 
used in any kind of major way by law enforcement. All right, I got one story here real quick that has nothing to do with foreign policy, but nonetheless is a great example of how incompetent the federal government is. You have the ATF, which is Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, meaning it's the federal agency tasked with enforcing gun laws. And apparently there's some kind of program where different federal agencies send guns to the ATF to be destroyed. I'm assuming what happens is, is like the FBI or the DA will do a raid. They'll end up with finding some handguns and some cash or something like that. And then hopefully they use that as tri- at trial, but probably, you know, it just goes to plea deal. And then whoever the guns and the money were taken from ends up in jail. And the guns are just sitting around and the FBI needs something to do with them because I'm guessing they just don't want to have a room full of guns in the basement. So they send them over to the ATF, who is supposed to destroy the guns. Apparently what the ATF, or at least one employee at the ATF, decided to do was steal some of them. Uh, This included machine guns and about 3,000 slides and firing mechanisms from Glotz. And then put those back on the street, sold them. So, you know, this is in the most fundamental way, really undermining what the ATF is tasked to do. You know, the federal government says, hey, this agency is so important that we have to have it and it has to have a whole bunch of funding and ability to go kick down American doors because alcohol, tobacco and firearms are just so dangerous that, you know, that we just need an agency tasked to do that. And in this case, you know, it it really just works against them because you know, we spend all the this money trying to get these guns and, you know, I'm guessing they would use the language, take them off the streets and, you know, take guns away from the bad guys. Well, guess what? They end up being sold. And I'm guessing black market d- guns typically don't go to people who would rather buy them at Walmart. Corruption in the Pentagon. As I've talked about on the show, there was a Pentagon contract worth $10 billion put out to develop cloud systems for the Pentagon. I don't understand the cloud system well enough to explain what the contract was for, but there are three major bidders, Oracle, IBM, and Amazon, who ends up getting the contract. Now, there were ways this could have gone down with Amazon only getting a chunk and IBM and Oracle also getting different parts of that $10 billion to design different parts of the cloud somehow. At the end, though, the $10 billion in whole goes to Amazon to build this system. Now, Oracle has filed a complaint with some kind of ethics review board saying that Amazon had an unfair advantage because on October 4th, they made some kind of agreement with a Pentagon employee who was involved in making the selection of the company to get the contract for that employee to come work at Amazon. However, that employee didn't recuse himself and announce his bias until October 31st when he then announced that, hey, I have to remove myself here because one of the companies that I have part ownership in uh, is subcontracting on one of the different bids to build this system on this contract. And so I, this seems like to me like baseline corruption, right? You like get somebody in the Pentagon, you offer them a job and you say, boy, it'd be really nice if, you know, you help your new company out here and you just tell them how great we are there and how the style that we've chosen to build this system is the absolute best one. And You need to go our way and with our method and everything. The documentation is all done at The Intercept, and that article will be linked in the show notes page. One quick immigration story. A six-year-old girl, I believe she was originally from India, died in the Arizona desert after she was dropped off by smugglers on, I guess, the American side of the border. 22 hours later, the little girl is dead. I mean, it's tragic, first of all, that, you know, this happens. And the real thing I I want to use this to shine light on isn't necessarily immigration policy, but this policy where American law enforcement are arresting people and destroying water left for these migrants out in the desert. So what some activists do is they go fill up a bunch of melt juds or different kinds of ways to drink water, and they stick it out in places where maybe somebody who's wandering through the desert in Arizona And probably isn't carrying a lot of water because it's heavy and they're just trying to walk to somewhere to, you know, apply for asylum or meet up with family or friends in the United States. Could get some, get some water that way. Uh, it, it will make their journey a little bit easier and safer because people do die out in the desert like this. It's, it's just important to remember that, you know, it was U.S. police and border patrol that are preventing people from putting water out there to help these people. 
onto the story from the New York Times about the U.S. Cyber Command starting to develop more offensive abilities towards the Russian power grid. When I read this story, it seemed to me that this program was in the future tense, although there are some parts where it seems more like present tense. So I can't tell if the U.S. currently has this capability and has developed it, is working on it, but it's not ready to go, or if it's something that they would like to do, they're thinking about doing, but maybe not yet. Either way, I'm sure this story was extremely concerning to Russia. The U.S. has carried out cyber warfare in the past. The most well-known and best example is Stuxnet, which was used to destroy civilian nuclear technology in Iran. And so if you're Russia, you're reading this story with the knowledge that the U.S. has carried out cyber warfare in the past, knows that there's been a lot of false reporting in American media about Russia targeting U.S. voting machines voter rolls, and even the power grid. Of course, that story was retracted, but all the same, a lot of people still believe that it, it was the Russians who attacked a power grid in Burlington, Vermont, I believe, right, what was that, then to 2015, 2016, or right then, 2016, maybe the beginning of 2017, when the Russia hysteria was just absolutely insanely crazy. But even though that story happened at that time of kind of heightened assignment, that narrative is still believed by quite a few people. And so if you're Russia and you see a situation where the U.S. has used cyber warfare in the past and the American people and the American media uh, push this narrative and believe this narrative that Russia has been aggressive against the U.S. Uh, cyberly in the past, then you had to, I guess, be naive to assume that the U.S. may not be looking to carry out some kind of offensive threat against Russia. Now, while cyber warfare doesn't sound like as big of a deal, even if it you know destroys some maybe government radars or something like that, or the power goes out for a day or something, I think most people, especially in the U.S., probably think, "Oh, this this isn't quite as big of a deal as anything else." But at the end of the day, you know, we all these countries have talked about responding to cyber warfare with just physical military warfare, and so any kind of steps down this road are extremely dangerous and even if it isn't immediately clear that this is going to escalate it could very well do that or even if it's not the the part that really the straw that breaks the camel's back but it's just a part of it we've talked about sanctions against russia not only economic based sanctions trying to prevent russia from easily exporting liquefied natural gas into europe through the Nord Stream 2 pipeline or sanctions for things that russia didn't do like at the 2016 election or the Skripal poisoning, or tensions with Russia around Syria or the Black Sea. All these little pieces start to add up more and more and more, and it makes it unlikely for great things to happen like arms control, nuclear weapons reduction, not weaponizing space, uh, more commerce between the two countries. But if uh, some crisis does end up breaking out and for some unfortunate reason American and Russian forces end up firing at each other in Syria, a good relationship between the two countries means that officials are able to easily meet, they determine what happened, everybody who's at fault says, you know, ah, yeah, we really shouldn't have done that, and, you know, they kind of shake off the, the dust up there, uh, which is, you know, what happened in Syria at one point. But if things are really bad, uh, then maybe the officials don't need. Then the conversations that need to happen don't happen, and just more and more ex escalation until bigger warfare breaks out. An interesting part of this story is apparently the president didn't know about it. This is very close to the end of the story, and Caitlin Johnstone does the best work talking about this and highlighting its significance at Consortium News. And this article, again, linked at the show notes page. But what Caitlin Johnstone points out is... It said the, the decisions here were made without the president's knowledge. And there's a lot it could be, and Caitlin Johnstone points this out, that this just isn't true. The president was aware. Maybe the official who said it was lying to make Trump look bad. Maybe the official who said it was not lying, but just didn't know that Trump knew because, you know, Trump wanted to be in the loop about it, but didn't want people to know they knew about it. That way, if it ever came out, he could say, well, I didn't know about it. Trump has denied that this program and policy even exists, so it, it could also be that this is just more New York Times fake news. Uh, that wouldn't be shocking to me or I'm sure my listeners either. One interesting piece to what Caitlin Johnstone brings up there, uh, I found to connect with something I read from Daniel Larson at the American Conservative, 
when he questions how much John Bolton is in charge of the Trump's foreign policy. He points to an example where John Bolton was advocating to change or to name the IRGC, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, a terrorist organization, and the Pentagon opposed this move. Of course, Patrick Shanahan is the acting Secretary of Defense, so maybe his wings are a little clipped for that reason, but uh, certainly he didn't stand up on this issue, and John Bolton was apparently able to bully it through. And also, it, it seems that Bolton is doing something that neocons, and he is notorious for, which is piling their personnel into different offices in the Pentagon to make sure that whatever's coming up to, you know, ends up at the acting Secretary of Defense's desk is what John Bolton wants him to see. After I saw the movie Vice, I believe that was in uh, the fall of 2018, I thought, man, this is probably something that could end up happening in the Trump administration, uh, similar to the Bush administration, where Cheney strategically places his people around President Bush. And not that this absolves President Bush of his guilt in going to Iraq, but he was really able to be influenced because of the way Cheney surrounded Bush and prevented him from hearing other narratives. And this could certainly be something that right now uh, John Bolton and it seems Mike Pompeo is always mentioned as being on board it is in large control of Trump's foreign policy. When we're looking at the U.S. relationship with Russia, Eastern Europe isn't looking any better with Donald Trump suggesting he may add a thousand troops to Poland. I actually think he said he was going to do this and potentially their station being Fort Trump, uh, just adding to the, you know, the president's ego there. You would think, I, I, I at least thought that Donald Trump actually had enough sense to realize that it's almost too much flaunting to have, like, let's say a fort in Poland named after him that he built on his watch, or let's say after he recognizes the Golan Heights as Israeli territory, the Israelis name a settlement after him. But that actually happened too. So maybe this is the way uh, Poland gets the United States to deploy more and more troops to Poland by saying, hey, for Trump, you know, it's looking kind of weak over there. You only got a thousand troops. That other base has 6,000 troops. I guess we need more Americans to be sent to Poland. In Hong Kong, we have protests continuing and really growing now, demanding the resignation of the leader of Hong Kong, Carrie Lam. For a quick review of how we got to this point, in the 90s, Hong Kong becomes an autonomous region of China, maintaining its own economic and judicial systems. I have read reports in recent days of analysts and people in Hong Kong, especially protest leaders, saying that they feel like over time that autonomy that Hong Kong had has been eroded. I've also heard people in Taiwan who advocate for Taiwan remaining a separate country and not becoming like Hong Kong, a autonomous region of China and signing an agreement that says that, you know, they say, well, over time, our autonomy will be eroded and eventually will become like Tibet or like the Uyghurs in China who are oppressed minority groups. A couple of weeks ago, it comes out that Hong Kong is looking to pass an extradition law that would allow people to be extradited from Hong Kong to the Chinese mainland. Now, from reading the law the best I can in whatever translation I read, it could be right, it could be wrong, or it could misunderstand words or the way the Hong Kong legal system works, but it seemed like this was a fairly standard kind of what you would expect for extradition, like if somebody steals a million dollars in Beijing and somehow escapes to Hong Kong, you would expect that Hong Kong would send that person in, if possible, the money back to Beijing because, you know, that's where the crime was committed. That's where the victim is. And so that could be what the law is. Or as protest leaders have argued, it is going to be similar to what you have within the rest of the Chinese mainland, which is a more oppressive state. And they arrest people for political reasons. And especially if China is looking to project more influence over Hong Kong, certainly having the ability to extradite pe people uh, of the opposition uh, for political reasons, but using the legal system would be a, an easy way to gain more influence and have more influence in Hong Kong. So I, I really understand, you know, that angle of it. And I'm not sure which way this all leans in, in what to expect from, you know, if, if a law is passed, how much it'll be used for oppression and how much it'll just be used to hold people of violent crimes, uh, you know, accountable for their actions. So after the protests come out, the leader of Hong Kong, uh, Lam 
I guess says, you know, well, we're not doing it. You know, it's obviously unpopular. Uh, I even read analysis that maybe Beijing ordered this saying, you know, they didn't want a whole bunch of uprising. You know, maybe they were looking to snip a little bit of autonomy, but it turns out here that the people rose up and made it too much noise. And rather than inspiring a major rebellion and revolution in Hong Kong, just back off and say, if you want to maintain that autonomy, if that's what those people want, then then that's what they could have. And then I read middle to end of last week that the protest movement seemed to really fizzle. About a thousand people showed up one day. There were small clashes, I believe, around the parliament. But overall, it seemed that the protesters in general have felt that they had won the fight that they wanted to fight, that they made sure that extradition law wouldn't be put in place, and that they had gone home. And had the extradition law come back one day, they would be out again in the streets to protest it, but they didn't need the leader to step down or anything like that. Leader issues an apology, and within a day or two, major protests start breaking out. I, I see counts in the millions now. A number of people in Hong Kong coming out demanding that the leader step down there. And for me, this raises a a couple of red flags, at least, just as to there may be something suspect going on here. Or it may just be the way things played out in Hong Kong this time around. And I don't understand it because I don't live there. I'm not from there. And I'm not reading all the right news sources. I I fully admit that's possible. I just want everybody to know uh, to the best of my ability what's going on there. I particularly want to keep libertarians informed. Because the Libertarian Party chair went after the Ron Paul Institute and Ron Paul on this issue, and I think in a couple of bigger ways as well with some other tweets. So I'll get into that now. The Ron Paul Institute ran a story, and I don't know um, how much I, I buy the conclusions drawn in it, but I think it makes an interesting case. Well, it certainly lays out uh, with evidence that U.S. NGOs have funded uh, the the protest movement to some degree in Hong Kong. Now, this could be just helping people who are generally interested get bused to uh, the event and, and then they're able to take place. Or this could be the case where they're pumping in so much money they're able to generate more interest in the protest and much larger protest than is reflective of how the people of Hong Kong feel. I felt the Ron Paul Institute article there, and it wasn't written by Ron Paul or Dan McAdams, but I thought maybe the conclusions in that article were too strong and that it's possible there are some legitimate protest movements here in Hong Kong, and it probably downplayed what is actually felt by the people there. However, I I really don't know that for sure, and I think it's an interesting perspective. It's the same reason uh, why when I went on the pseudo-intellectual podcast, which you could all check out. I'll I'll link to the episode in the show notes page. I talk about the case Elijah Menier and Moon of Alabama blog are making when it comes to Iran possibly carrying out attacks uh, against cargo ships in the Sea of Oman and at the port in the UAE and shows, you know, why Iran may have incentive to do so. And that's not to say, oh, the U.S. needs to go to war with Iran or that, you know, this is some kind of regime change effort in Hong Kong. But it is worth it to be aware of those positions and those perspectives because sometimes it could help the world make sense. In this case, if maybe the U.S. was able to start to generate interest in having the leadership step down after the more genuine protests burnt itself out on the extradition law, then then maybe that NGO perspective starts to make more sense to me. I don't know. It's just one interpretation, but keep your eye open on that kind of stuff. Anyways. The LP chair was critical of Ron Paul for putting out this article in this tweet, uh, basically saying that, oh, look, Ron Paul stands with dictators in Beijing against the the free loving people of Hong Kong. Now, clearly, the reason why Ron Paul put out this article is he's very aware. And if you listen to the show, you'll know that him and Dan Adams really pay attention to what U.S. NGOs are doing and how that's fueling different movements in different countries, and whether it's Hong Kong, Ukraine, Venezuela, Nicaragua. I I remember so many times them looking at this angle on that show, and it's a very important angle to pay attention to. And it's something the U.S. shouldn't be doing. If American people individually, I suppose, want to go out and give money to the people of Hong Kong to help them protest and uh, get more freedom, then by all means, like I, I don't believe in stopping you on that at all. But the U.S. government should not be stealing money from our taxpayers and then redistributing it to the people of Hong Kong 
it's not promoting freedom. And oftentimes these kind of initiatives led by the U.S. I, I think caused real disasters in countries. I mean, look at Ukraine. Sarwak also refers to Ron Paul and a couple of, uh, in the Institute and a couple other tweets uh, where he basically says that we shouldn't be defending or building up like the governments of Venezuela. And I'm guessing this is in part because of a video the LP treasurer of Hawaii put out and I believe was retweeted by the party chair. And I got me, I didn't listen to the video, but basically it takes a very socialism is the only problem in Venezuela approach which for anybody who listens to this show knows that is far more complicated than that. And U.S. sanctions on Venezuela have caused an awful lot of problems in that country and an awful lot of the the suffering that goes among those people. Also, just the fact that the U.S. is hostile against Venezuela and the the countries have a confrontational relationship and the U.S. being the world empire has certainly hurt, you know, Venezuela in the past 20 years, uh, really since the Chavez revolution. And so Sarwak is attacking Ron Paul for understanding the nuance and for saying that the U.S. is a world empire and you should look there first. And that's where, especially as Americans, we need to pay attention to and demand change. We shouldn't be demanding that Maduro step down. And if the people of Venezuela want that, let them have that revolution. Let them, you know, if they want to try to go out and get more freedom or whatever they want to do, let them have that. But our position should not be oh, we need to get rid of Maduro. It's just not our business. And I don't know how the the LP chair doesn't understand this. It's extremely confusing to me. But my guess is he he just doesn't pay enough attention to the issues and watches some video that doesn't give enough context and thinks he knows everything. And that, you know, that's why it's so important to stay on top of things when it comes to foreign policy. You know, a point I've been trying to make a lot recently is that the libertarians should have the best advantage on foreign policy. I mean, if you look at wars like Vietnam and Iraq, almost anybody you meet, including a lot of veterans of those wars, will admit that they were disasters, uh, that we we were lied into those wars, that they didn't produce positive benefits, that we lost those wars, they cost too much money, they cost too many American lives, Americans committed too many war crimes in the process of those wars. And just think about that. I mean, these are massive... I'm not sure how high the, the Vietnam War price cost, but you know, when we're talking about Iraq, multi-trillion dollar project that everybody knows is a failure. If I go and ask any of my friends, you know, should we have gone to Iraq? They'll say no. I'll say, was it, you know, did it help bring freedom to the Iraqi people? They'll say no. And if I ask if we are lied into that war, they'll say yes. So, you know, it, it's an ultimate failure of a government project and we should be rubbing it in everybody's faces all day long. Look. When the government does the biggest things, its biggest projects, it fails the hardest. And that's why we have to reject this world empire and we cannot be the policeman in the world and save everyone. It's an example of how all pro, you know, presidents, you know, say what you will about Barack Obama's Obamacare healthcare system that, you know, made it harder for Americans to get covered and made coverage a lot more poor and expensive for a lot of people. And that was disastrous. Absolutely. But. He also blockaded and starved the Yemeni people to death and, you know, sold Saudi Arabia a bunch of bombs to kill children and hospitals and schools. That just seems like a lot bigger of a deal to me and should be the thing that we could be always harping on as, as why we can't have government. It's also the most, you know, conclusive. If you ask people, you know, was Social Security a failure? Well, they're, they're probably going to disagree or a lot of LBJ's were against poverty programs. Yeah, they'll say all those are a success and, and, you know, find ways to argue it. But if they if you ask them if LBJ's war in Vietnam was a success, they'll say no. Same with, you know, George Bush's social programs. Uh, You know, people like those, but they, you know, know his Iraq war was stupid and, and think we should have never done that. And so they're easy points to win as libertarians. And they're contrary to, you know, most of the kind of mainstream Republican Democrat consensus, even though the rest of the people know it. And it's unbelievably disappointing. That the LP chair doesn't pick up on this and somehow ends up being worse on foreign policy than anything else. And maybe it's just because he's looking to score publicity points by attacking uh, the most well-known libertarian, Ron Paul. (laughs) But it's not good for the libertarian movement. Real quick on Venezuela here. I I read a story in the AP and they had five anonymous sources telling them that five European countries are considering sanctioning Venezuela along with the United States 
it doesn't seem that these sanctions, if this is even real at all, would be equivalent to the U.S. sanctions and would be targeted against the country's leadership. But my hope would be is that the Europeans don't go along with this aggressive U.S. foreign policy, give the Venezuelans more outlet for trade, which they desperately need. I, I mean, one of the reasons Venezuela has blackouts is because of poor socialism. But another major reason is that the generators they need are produced by a German company. And the German company won't sell it to Venezuela in fear of getting secondary sanctions from the United States. So if the Venezuelans are sitting around without power tonight, yeah, it's in part because of their communist government. But in large part, it's because the U.S. won't let them get the generators they need and probably can afford. A lot of Venezuelan refugees are leaving for the northern border of Peru, and apparently Peru is going to crack down on that. So I guess pay attention for possible conflict there and understanding that there's some change in the law that, that may lead up to that. All right, I've talked way too much about everything else, but I am going to get through a little bit of this Iran news today. One of the ultra hots, Senator Tom Cotton, I believe he's a Middle East war veteran and I think very dangerous. People constantly float his name for high-level cabinet positions, including Secretary of Defense, said that the U.S. should respond with military strikes against Iran. Now, as I said, I talk about this subject a lot on the Pseudo Intellectual Podcast, which I'm going to link to in the show notes page. But I have enough respect for Mu of Alabama and Elijah Manier to really think about the argument that they're making on this topic, that Iran may be trying to hit back against the U.S. in this economic war that the U.S. offensively launched against Iran for absolutely no reason. So I want 100% discount that Iran may be responsible for this attack. That said, there's no evidence to prove that anybody did whatsoever. Any evidence that the U.S. produces absolutely unusably grainy and unfocused video to the point where I'm just unbelievably shocked that it was possibly produced in 2019. It's the worst video I've seen produced this year. Um, I know I'm sure it's from a long distance away and everything, and maybe it's hard to capture with all the movement and the waves, but you definitely cannot see the Iranians picking up a mine like the U.S. said. If you look at the damage on the ships, it doesn't look like it was a mine that did that damage as well. So don't believe John Bolton, but also be skeptical of anybody saying too strongly that it's just a false flag. Now, the U.S. is also trying to blame Iran for everything, including Mike Pompeo said uh, a terrorist attack committed by the Taliban in Kabul. And of course, Iran and the Taliban really don't work together. So it's a head scratcher of how Iran could be blamed there. And then... Iran was also responsible for the Houthis shooting down an MQ-9 U.S.-operated drone over Yemen. Now, to me, the, the bigger question raised here was, why the hell was a U.S. drone flying over the Houthi areas of Yemen? If U.S. drones are targeting anybody in Yemen, it should be Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula or the Islamic State affiliate there, not the groups fighting against AQAP and ISIS, and that's, of course, the Houthis, who, while... When this war started, certainly weren't Iranian-backed rebels may now have, you know, received more support from Iran. I'm not sure how extensive that goes, but certainly are not an Iranian prodigy like Hezbollah. And even if the Houthis did shoot down this drone, U.S. drone, in Yemen with Iranian technology, it doesn't mean that the Houthis weren't doing it in self-defense anyways. You know, if Israel uses an American missile defense system to intercept some kind of rocket coming from you know southern lebanon or syria or gaza that's not equivalent to the americans shooting it down it's the israeli shooting it down with an american weapon it's completely a different scenario and the houthis are doing this and acting out their own self-interest as they're besieged by the united states and saudi arabia they can't get food into the people who live there and they're constantly being bombed and attacked from all sides and so, yeah, they're carrying out attacks in Saudi Arabia and against the different armies fighting a war against them. But that doesn't mean that Iran is carrying out those attacks, even if there is some backing from Iran. One of the things uh, when we look at the Iranian nuclear deal now that's going to be important coming up isn't that the U.S. is demanding that Iranians just comply with the agreement that the United States signed, the JCPOA or the nuclear deal. But the U.S. is trying to push Iran to go even f further and comply with a list of 10 to 12 demands given by Mike Pompeo uh, back in the fall 
which were completely absurd. Like four or five of them just weren't true, you know, false premises. You know, they have to claim that Iran is trying to build a nuclear capable missile uh, to get Iran to stop building a nuclear capable missile. They're just not building one. And also demanding Iran withdraw support from groups that Iran's probably not supporting like Al-Qaeda. But according to the nuclear deal, Iran is supposed to have a cap on nuclear fuel that they hold. Iran has recently accelerated the rate at which they're producing nuclear fuel. And this means that they're going to bust through that cap in the JCPOA. Uh, Iran said within 10 days. I had read a report earlier that actually was two months. But maybe they even accelerated the rate they were producing it faster since the IAEA last inspected. Either way, this writ's putting Iran out of compliance with the nuclear agreement. Of course, the United States is just going to point to it and say, aha, we know it. They're trying to make nuclear bombs. Uh, That's not what's happening here. The U.S. broke the agreement that was supposed to help the Iranian economy recover and grow stronger and instead has absolutely sabotaged it. And this is the Iranians responding by starting to break the agreement to show that, hey, we're not going to remain within an agreement that puts additional safeguards and restrictions on our civilian nuclear energy program if you're not going to abide by the sanctions relief that you promised for doing so. All right, guys, it's a little bit of a long show show. Maybe abrupt ending, but I'm going to wrap up there. Foreign Policy Focus, uh, check it out on Twitter. My handle there is still at K-Y-A-A-A-L-E. There is a private Facebook group. There is a Patreon page slash Foreign Policy Focus for both. Like I said, live stream this week. I'll send out a link uh, Thursday at 9 p.m. Eastern to all the patrons and guys who come in and ask questions and chat with me. And hopefully it'll be some fun. LibertarianInstitute.org and um, subscribe to the show. Give it ratings and reviews.